Good morning and good afternoon, Crossley community. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. When I look at those pilgrimage, whenever they came to the house, to the Jerusalem and look at the temple, they're like, my God, I'm so excited standing next to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they told me, let's come to the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? There is something I learned about. Before I was traveling, 
Uh, I love to go, like during my youth, I like, I like to go on like crusades, different conferences, and I kind of learned something, it bothered me in a way, that whenever I traveled the longer distance, I was somehow more blessed than the conference somewhere like locally. And I was like, why? Why is it happening like this? And I remember one day, it was crazy. We, I was like about 19 years old. And I took my brother, Vitaly, he was like 14 years old. And we went to Canada to Benihin Crusade. I had only $40 in my pocket. Hotels, forget it. I can't afford it. Just enough for McDonald's to cover me and my brother. And we got stuck in the border. And I was like only 19 years old, Vitaly is only 14. And they told us, where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to the crusade. They're like, what? Crusade? <laughs> they like pull over. <laughs> they searched our entire car. They were questioning Vitaly because he's younger, trying to get some information from him. And we got to the crusade and it was like such a powerful service. And then I remember he came like somewhere like here, like locally. And it wasn't as much kind of powerful for me, like not much as impact. And then I began to question, why is it? Until the Lord, He revealed its expectation. When you pay the price, when you travel, you expect to get something. And then when I realized that, I began to come to the services, expecting something to receive from God. Are you expecting to get a miracle from God today? If you are sick, expect the healing of God today. When you need the powerful presence, the touch of God, expect it. And you unleash, you release the faith, you unleash and you release the glory of God. And I believe through the worship, we're expecting that God, He's going to bless us. Through the word, God, He's going to change our lives. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you glad? I am so glad to be today, not somewhere else but to stay in the house, to be in the house of the Lord, to see the Lord's beauty. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Lord, so much, Lord. We're expecting, Lord. We're expecting from you the miracles, Lord. We're expecting from you the fresh manna from heaven, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your power. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, bless everyone in this place, Lord. If somebody is heartbroken, heal him in Jesus' name. If somebody is discouraged, Lord, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, meet that person today in Jesus' name. If somebody doesn't know you much, Lord, reveal yourself today in Jesus' name, Lord. We thank you so much for this amazing morning, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Bless us. We worship you. We honor you. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Jesus, we lift up your name. We lift up your name. We magnify your name. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome to this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome to this place. Let every heart adore. And we lift up your name. We lift up your name over every situation that we endure, over every storm that we come across. We lift up your holy name and we welcome you with the highest praise. We welcome you with the highest praise. And we pray that what we do in this place, that it serve as an altar for your Holy Spirit to come and to begin to move, to begin to change hearts and change lives to begin to change us and reform us, to make us more like you. We're believing on your Holy Spirit, Father God, to rest upon this place, to change the ground upon which we stand. We believe on you to come with the power of miracles, signs, and wonders in this place. We believe on you to come and change hearts. We believe on you to come and move with power and might. And we bless your name. We bless your holy name. You. I worship you. You 
us today, whatever we've come in with, all of our situations are different, all of our circumstances, but your promise for us is the same for every person in this place. We are all your children. We are all the children of God here. You hear every one of our prayers the same. We thank you, Jesus, that we can turn to the way maker, that we can turn to the promise keeper in this place. Thank you that you are faithful, Jesus. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Let's believe this today. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. take this time to honor the one who's seated on the throne, the one who has purchased our salvation with his very blood. That is why we celebrate every day. Father, all honor to your name. We turn our complete gaze to you, Jesus, that you would be honored in this place among us. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. There's no one else, Father. We honor you. We honor you.
Hallelujah, God. We sing to you. We sing, and Father, we plead to you, Lord. Stir up our hearts. Stir it up, Father, for your movement, Jesus. Let us not rely on everything of the world, Father. Let us not be like the pool of Bethesda, Father, where we have to wait for some kind of spirit to spirit stir up the water so a movement can happen inside of our lives, Father. I pray that the living water that is within us, Lord, the Holy Spirit, be stirred up within us, Lord, and let the miracles rain through it, Lord, because today is a day for your movement, for your spirit to feel free here today, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to talk about something that uh, David did, and it's been been on my heart for a little while. And um, uh, Serge was sharing about this on Friday, kind of the topic we talked about it on on our small group. It's just. It's, it's, been, it's been something that I've been thinking about for a little bit. And uh, there was a time when David decided to take the Ark of the Covenant and move it. And the first time he takes it and he moves it, and he's like, you know what, I'm kind of terrified of this covenant. I'm going to drop it off at this guy's house called Obed-Edom. And he drops it off there. And I don't want to focus in on the beginning of the story because I think that he did it wrong. He goes and drops it off there, and then he he starts to live his life. And he comes back, and he's like, why is his house blessed and mine isn't right now? And David, being a smart man after the heart of God, he understands. He's like, well, the, the problem is that I took the, li- the, f- the little, literal pr- uh, presence of God and I dropped it on in his house. And he's like, I want that. I deserve to have that. So he decides to go back. And there's five kilometers between those two. If you don't really understand, that's three miles, a little bit more than three miles. And he decides to go back, and he's like, I'm going to take that Ark of the Covenant and bring it back to my house. I want that presence of God. I want the peace inside of my house. I want the blessings that come from that inside of my house. But he says something in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse Uh, 13 and 14 which should really dictate how we act and when we understand that the presence of God is coming here he says and when those who have bore the ark of the Lord now he took soldiers with them so he wasn't alone here they had gone six steps so every six steps they go Do you know how many steps are in in three miles? It's about 2,000 steps a mile. That's 6,000 steps. That means a 1,000 times he decided to do this. And he says every six steps have gone. He has sacrificed an ox and a fatted animal. And then David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And here is what I want to really focus in on. And it's been changing my life for a little while. And it's, it's the, the idea that we forget how to praise God for something that he's going to do. And David, he knew though the presence of God is in that house. And it wasn't blessing his house yet. But he goes and he decides. He's like, there's 6,000 steps. Every six steps, I'm going to stop and I'm going to worship and I'm going to sacrifice. And I'm going to praise God for what is going to come. I'm going to praise him for what the blessings are going to be inside of my house when the Ark of the Covenant are residing there. And we have to realize that today when we come into the presence of God these six steps haven't changed much because six steps go and on the seventh he praised him he offered him something six days go by we praise him and we offer him something we don't offer fatted calves but now we offer our time our finances our worship we try and we offer him because we know what is going to come don't let 
the devil try to steal your praise because that is dedicated to our God. And if you had six steps go by, six days in the desert where it's dry and hot and hard to carry a heavy box filled with the presence of God and it's been miserable six steps and now you get to the seventh, it didn't matter what the six steps were because from now on you're praising and worshiping the, uh, the God Almighty. We need to be able to praise him and worship him for the smaller things that have come. Like I learned today that one of our, our fellow um, members, Bogdan, came back from Bible school. We need to praise that somebody went there and came back. We have other people that are joining here today. And we ought to praise those people that are coming here. Not because the church is growing, but because people are understanding that there's a God in heaven that loved them so much. That he died for their sins and that nothing else matters in this world now but to worship and praise him. And now we can be in his presence and dance and have fun and just worship. Worship him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let the ushers come up, Lord. Uh, Lord, take this offering. Take it as what we can't give you, Lord. And we can and we want to, Lord. And this is just not even for what you gave us, Lord. It's because we know what you can do, Lord. We saw you move yesterday. We saw you move today. And I believe that you're going to move tomorrow. You're going to keep on going, Lord. That you are the same God that was back in Israel, back in those days. That you are the same today, Lord. And stir up that living water inside of our hearts. Stir it up inside of our lives, Lord. Lord, let us not go a day, Father, without understanding that the powers of God are within us. And Lord, let us cherish it, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the finances. Bless it all, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the people that have gone out for that, that school, Lord, and came back, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the people that are even coming here, Jesus. You know we're here, Father, for you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. It's gloomy outside, it might be raining outside, but there is no gloom in the kingdom of God. There is rejoicing, there is deliverance, there is healing, and there is freedom. And we don't have to call upon the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us and all of those things are in us. So it's a great day to be alive. We welcome all of you to Crosslight Church today. We thank you for joining us. For those of you who are joining us online, we honor you and thank you as well for tuning in and pray that one day soon you as well can join us here and worship and fellowship with us. Uh, before we move on and hear the word that God has in store for us today, I'd like to share a few very important announcements. The first is that beginning tomorrow, Vacation Bible School, VBS, begins tomorrow. So if you've signed your kids up, just keep that in mind. Tomorrow would be the day as well to pay for any of the children that are going for VBS this coming week. My next announcement is that on the weekend of the 27th and the 28th of August is Family Camp. So if you have not signed up and have a desire to go to family camp, make sure you reach out to Yevgeny Gutsul. Find him. He will plug you in and give you all of the information that you need. That same weekend on the 27th and 28th will be our annual tag sale here on the church property. So um, if you're available those dates, let us know. We'd love to plug you in and have you join us and minister in that way as people from the community who otherwise would never step foot on our property will find themselves here in this place just for a bargain. So it's going to be a great opportunity to, to haggle some prices, but also to minister to people in our community and to greet them and welcome them to our church. Two weeks before our tax sale dates, we will begin to collect the items if you would like to donate them. We'll begin to collect them here at our church. Please just hold on to them for just a little while longer. Don't bring them to church just yet. We still have to prepare a storage area for us to put those items in. But two weeks before tax sale, we will begin to collect donations. Amen. Um, I'd like to invite to the stage my brother Carlos. Carlos, if you're here, if you can just run up, sprint up to the stage. Just sprint. Uh, brother Carlos joins us from Holyoke, Massachusetts. He's been coming to our church for quite a bit of time now. And uh, come up here. 
and uh, he's made the decision that he wants to go one step further and plug himself into this community. So we've officially received Brother Carlos into the Crosslight community, the Crosslight family. He's joined us officially as a member of this family, and we just believe that God is going to use him immensely and powerfully uh, in this church, in this ministry, in this community. He comes from a background of missions. He's been pretty much all over the world. Uh, he, he has the gift of teaching. He's got a great anointing upon him, so we believe that Carlos is going to be a great blessing towards our community. So if you see him around more often, know this is him. He's a member. He's here to serve. So if you have a need, just find him, and he'd be happy to help you out. So let's just briefly rise to our feet, and we're going to bless our brother Carlos as he enters into our community here. Heavenly Father, we come, and we just thank you for our brother. We thank you for his heart. We thank you for the anointing that rests upon him, Father God. And Lord, we pray that as he begins to get active in this church, that you would just open up doors, Lord, in areas where he needs to serve, where he needs to pour out, Father God. I pray that you open up the global missions field so that he can once again go, Lord, and serve over there, Father God, in different countries. We bless your name. We honor you, and we thank you, Jesus, for the decision that he made to be a member of your body first and now a member of this body, of this church and community. We honor your name, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen. Brother Carlos, we bless you and honor you and thank you. So much for the step trick family that was beautiful wasn't it wow had like a hint of the south felt like i was a cracker barrel for a little while but thank you so much this dear family you guys are amazing welcome 
You're welcome. You guys can talk back to me. I'm not going to. Thank you. Hi, hi. All right, let's all of us open up to Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to read from verses 13 through the 21st. Again, that's Matthew chapter 14. And we will read from verse 13 through verses 21. And guys, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord. It is so good to be at church. I do a decent amount of traveling throughout the year. A lot, a lot of times I'll go to missions trips. A lot of times I'll go to work and other trips. And it's a fact. Whenever I'm out of, out of, the, uh, out of the city for a number of days, I always like to just come into the church and just sit here. Nobody's here. It's either at night maybe or some, sometimes during the daytime. And it's just, just good to be in, in this place. There's something about this place. At night, get, at night it gets a little creepy because it's dark and all you see is a red exit sign. So it's like, it's pitch black but red in it. But aside from that, it's, it's an awesome, awesome place. There's something about the church that's just so awesome. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 through the 21st. And when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw the great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, so they may go into the villages and buy for themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And then they, and they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. Then he commanded that the multitude sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And, and looking up to heaven, he blessed it and broke it and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. And so they all ate and they were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of from fragrance that remained. And now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. Praise God. I think it's an amazing story. This is one of the few stories in the Bible, in the uh, four Gospels that is mentioned in each and every one of the Gospels. I think it's awesome because it has to do with food and I'm hungry. And I think all, well, all the Gospels were written by men. So there's one miracle they all remembered vividly. That was the multiplication of food. So they all talked about it. They all made sure we all knew about the fact that food could be multiplied. And yeah, guys, I do want to quickly, before I begin to speak, want to give, uh, want to really say thank you to the church who has kept my little growing family in, in, our, in, in prayers as my wife, Alona, who's sitting right here. Come on, that's good. She's with us today. <laughs> Praise God. She went through a pretty difficult surgery where they had to remove a... Uh, a cyst that was 26 centimeters to be exact, which if we could just, it's like this big. So it was over 10, 10 pounds. In one surgery, she lost 10 pounds. And it was a very difficult surgery because the doctors kept throwing words in there su such as cancer and other words. And that's somewhat familiar to our family. So the whole last week was a very difficult week. Very, on one end, Thank God that the peace of God was just so, so, so strong between the both of us. But on the other hand there, it was a difficult week. But I really thank so many people that are in this place that may be watching for your text messages, for the, for, the, for the prayers, for the support, especially at those times it was much, much needed. But what I want to say from this, what God really opened up my eyes to is, is how, how much God cares for the very little details in our lives. I know that so many of us, we think that, okay, we're going to run to God in times of, I want to say difficulty, but when we think that we should. When things get so bad that we're going to run to God and, and that's, you know, that's a good time to run to him. But a lot of times we forget that God doesn't just care about the big problems that we have, but God is really there for us for the smallest issues for the smallest details and a lot of times we don't even know it but God is there by our side 
I think the parents in this place would agree that a lot of times when, you're, when the children grow up, one, two years old, especially when they just start to run around, a lot of times they carelessly run into things maybe into a corner or into a wall or whatever it is. And so many times, I've seen it, I have 30 nieces and nephews, no kids of my own, not yet, but 30 nieces and nephews, and I, we've seen everything. We've seen broken bones, we've seen hospitalizations, we've seen everything, nothing is new. So, but what I want to say by that is, a lot of times a kid, I mean, just, just recklessly running somewhere, and here's the parent just right before the kid hits the table, just picks him up and just, and just runs away with him. I want, to, I want to say this. Not one time did that child ever say, well, thank you, Daddy, for what you did to me. Not one time. The, the daddy probably would just saved them a nice big bruise or a gash in the face or, God forbid, something worse. But not one time did they turn around and they say, God, thank you so much for what you have done. They just kept on running, doing their own thing. As a matter of fact, they, they never even knew what their parent did to them. How could they know? They're too young. They don't, they don't know that they didn't even know that they were running around in a dangerous spot and what am I saying with this I remember years ago every every year every March I travel to Virginia for three weekends of, of the year and I work and it's usually a lot of work it's commission-based you're just working sweating and having a good time and I, and I remember after a long long weekend I'm driving home if I'm not driving I'm sleeping it's one or the other I don't like just sitting in the car and and just it's talking. It's not me. I like to drive or I, or, I, or I like to sleep. So usually I drive there and back, and I just love doing it. So remember, we were driving deep in the night, and my, and my tire pops. I'm thinking, all right, change the tire. Driving driving back home, and I remember I, had a, I, had a, I was on a Subaru at the time. So if one of your, it's a four-wheel drive car, all-wheel drive, and one of your tire pops, you got to change four of them. So I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, I don't need this right now. I don't need to take all the money I just made and dump it into this car. But anyways, um, as I'm driving, hours later, deep in the night, I'm driving, and all of a sudden, my spirit erupts inside of me and begins to thank God for what he, for the, the pop tire. And I'm thinking, what on earth is happening to me right now? I don't know what's going on, but yet inside of me, my spirit is praying and rejoicing and thanking. For me, it doesn't make any sense. We got home all safe and sound. Everything is fine, but that stuck with me. That stuck with me for a while, and I vividly remember this story when I was in, in the hospital last week because I don't know what, what could have happened. I really don't. I really don't, don't know why my spirit all of a sudden erupts in prayer, but I do know this. I do know that the spirit of God, the spirit that dwells inside of you, knows you better than you know yourself, and I think for us it's so important to realize that, I don't know, maybe God saved me from something. Maybe there was, it, it happened as it pulled into a gas station. So maybe it was going to pop when I'm doing 70, 80, 90 <laughs> on, the, on the highway. Maybe it popped at the time and it would bring great danger to the people. But my spirit recognized something that God was doing. And I think for us it is so important to realize that a lot of times we forget to thank God for the miracles that he, did, that he does in our life that we are aware of. But how many times have we thanked God for the miracles that he, that he did in our lives that, that we are not aware of? We're thinking, we're thinking in our lives that, yeah, it just so happens that we drive every day to work, to church, to our houses, and everything is just fine, you know, like everything, we have no problems, everything is just fine, and, and we don't think twice that maybe, maybe somewhere, somewhere throughout this day, we got caught up in something. God made something happen to where the drive through line was a little bit longer than we expected. And God supernaturally saved us from an accident. God saved us from something that was supposed to happen, but we didn't realize it because we don't know about it. And I want to remind every person in this place, many people sitting in this place would not be in this place right now if it hadn't been for the hand of God that is upon our lives. I'm telling you, it is easy to thank God for something that he did. 
Even sometimes we, we forget about. But I think God deserves the praise and the glory for the things that we don't know about. And just like a child running straight into the wall thinking there's nothing wrong and a parent grabbing that child and saving them from, from potential pain, how many times are we those same people going into destruction yet the hand of God is upon our lives and we don't even know it. We, we'll never even thank God for it, but God came through. We will never even know. So I think it's so important for us to just thank God for the things that he's, that he's doing in our lives, even if we don't know about it. I'm telling you guys, God is moving in your life. God is moving. Maybe sometime in heaven, in eternity, eternity is a very long time. Maybe in eternity, someday it'll be revealed to us. Maybe we'll know that wow, you know what, God really pulled through in this situation, but we just had no idea about it. We just had a phenomenal day, phenomenal life. Everything was just going according to plan, yet we had no idea that God's hand was upon our lives that whole time. Guys, our God is amazing. And I was really beginning to think about things like this as we were in the hospital because I'm thinking about myself. I have done some reckless things in my life. <laughs> I, have, I have been to reckless accidents to where the the police officer said you're so lucky you're buckled up because if you were not buckled up you would be dead on the spot and I'm thinking I wasn't buckled up but I'm not gonna tell him I wasn't buckled up because he'd give me a ticket for it or something but I'm like yeah yeah I'm like this is this is good but so many times in our lives that we don't recognize but God's hand is upon our lives and I know looking uh, Alona here today as it was from the beginning of the week to see how her now recovery is going good and I just thank God for her for his hand that is on her life amen, amen. we just read a portion of scripture where Again, like I said, every writer describes this story a little bit differently or they leave out certain, certain, um, certain, uh, certain, care, certain things while the other writer adds on certain things that maybe they didn't notice. But other writers write and say that they had a very long day. After a long day, Jesus decided to withdraw from the crowds as, as, as he did frequently. He withdrew from the crowds and he went into a deserted place. A place where it can only be him and Jesus. Him and Jesus. Him and God. No one else. For us, it's like us and Jesus. But for him, it's Jesus. And this is a common mistake. I'm going to make it more throughout this sermon. I, I've noticed that in morning how many times I made that mistake in the morning service. But anyways, Jesus spent time with God, left everybody else. And this is the lesson for us. If Jesus withdrew from the chaos of life to spend time with God one-on-one, -on -one, how much more do we need, need to do that? Amen? So therefore, Jesus withdrew by the boat and he was out there spending time with God, but the multitudes recognized that Jesus went away, and so they all began to run after Jesus. I mean, you can only imagine if Jesus gets into a lake and goes from one side to the other, it means the thousands of people that followed him ran around the whole entire lake trying to get to Jesus. And my question for each and every one of you is this. Was Jesus on his way to heal the sick? No. Was Jesus on his way to minister to those who were in need of it? No, he was not. Jesus was on his way to spend time with the Father. Was Jesus on his way to feed a bunch of disciples and a bunch of people? No, Jesus was not on his way. He was on his way to spend time with the God. But it just so happened that the people from a distance saw that Jesus was on his way somewhere. So they said, you know what? Wherever Jesus is going, that's where we are going. Wherever Jesus is going, that's where we're going to run to. So all of a sudden, the people began to run after Jesus. And here Jesus is on a boat, rowing away, having a good time. And he's, and he's just looking uh, 15 or so thousand people just flocking and running, chasing him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the Bible says that he was filled with compassion. And he turned around and he began to minister to them. He healed their sick. He spoke life into them. He fed them food. 
It was a good, good evening. After days of nonstop ministry, he dropped everything that he was doing just to spend time with those people. And the first, first lesson, I guess, from this portion of scripture is this. Guys, I believe hunger moves the heart of God. Those people were so desperate to receive from Jesus that Jesus was not on his way to heal them. Jesus was not, it was not in his plans to minister to people anymore that day. His plans was to go relax, just soak in the presence of God and have a good time. But those people with their hunger cried out to God as loud as possible. Jesus, we want you. Jesus, we need you. And Jesus dropped everything that he was doing and he began to spend time with them. He began to minister and to serve them. And I want to tell every person in this place that God responds to hunger. God responds to his people. When we are on fire for him, when we're burning for him, when we desire him. Any of you guys re remember the, um, the story in the Bible with the woman, the issue of blood? Jesus was on his way to, to heal Jairus' son. Jesus was on his way for a specific assignment to do a specific thing to a specific family, had no intention of healing that woman who was an outcast in society, yet this woman persevered through the whole crowd and just touched the hem of his garment and received from Jesus. Her hunger was, her hunger literally caught the attention of God. And just a little bit on the side note for all of us to to recognize something from the story that I think is so important. So I want to let you know that there was, it had nothing to do with the clothes of Jesus. The reason why she received from Jesus was not because she touched his clothes, but because her faith was so stirred up. And she said, if only I can get so close to Jesus, I can be healed. She was so hungry to receive from Jesus that for her just to touch a piece of his clothing, she knew she would be made whole. The hunger she had and that moved the very heart of God. You know, and I mean, this is this stories we, we see all throughout the Bible. A lot of times we look, oh man, the shadow of Peter was so powerful that he healed the sick. Guys, I want to let you know that the shadow of Peter had no power. The, the shadow of Peter had no power. What, the only power was on the people's faith that, faith that said, if only I can get so close to Peter, if only his shadow can touch me, we will be made whole. Had nothing to do with the shadow of Peter, had nothing to do with Peter, but had everything to do with the faith of the people. The faith of the people was so strong that it reacted God to move. The hunger of the people was so strong that it reacted God to move. Slava was, was talking earlier today about the uh, certain services and healing services that we as I get used to attend quite frequently. And he'll agree with, with this one testimony that you hear over and over and over again. And people will say they, they travel for days to get into this healing service. And they said that the moment they entered into the city, they saw the arena where the service is going to be held and instantly they were healed. It happened over and over and over again. I hear these testimonies over and over again. They said the moment we saw the arena from a distance, all the pain is gone. Now my question for you is this, does the arena have power? Where people drink, get drunk, go to concerts, cheer for sports, cheer for musical artists, idols, does, does, does that building have power? No. What had power was their faith that was so stirred up. They said, if, if the moment I get there, man, I'm going to receive from God. The moment they get there, they see the building where the service is going to be held, and instantly they're healed. What is my point there, guys? Hunger attracts the heart of God. When, 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 when we long for him, just like this woman with the issue of blood, persevered through everything just to get to Jesus. And the moment she touched the, the, the hem of his garment, she received the miracle from Jesus. 
Just like these, these poor people who were so desperate to receive from God that they said, man, if only the shadow of Peter can, 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 can touch us, we're, we're going to be made whole. And the shadow of Peter came upon them and they were made whole. It was because of their faith. Just like those people that just talked about that they said, man, if only we can get to the stadium. Man, we know that God will heal us. They just lay, lay their eyes in the stadium and, and God supernaturally heals them. And those people that we just read about Matthew chapter 14, they see Jesus from a distance rolling away. And here they are running after them, Jesus, Jesus, we just want to be with you. We want to be with you, Jesus. We want to be with you. And Jesus had no plans of being with them, but he saw their hunger. He saw their desire. He turned around and he ministered to them. He healed their sick. He taught them truths and he fed them. I just, want to, I just want to really encourage every person in this place. Guys, when we hunger for God, God responds. Amen. There's this very interesting portion of scripture that theologians puzzle over. Because in Luke ch chapter eight, uh, 18, it has a story about a man named uh, Blind Bartim Bartimaeus. The blind man, we'll call him. And... The, the Bible says these words, verse 35, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting at the roadside begging. And, he, and when he heard the crowd, he asked those around us, them, he said, what's happening? They said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So we know the story. They all, all of a the sudden, they cry out, Jesus of Nazareth, please come to me. The son of David, have mercy on me. And what's interesting is that the same story is also um, talked about by Matthew in, in uh, that's Matthew chapter 20 verse 29 and the Bible says as they went out of Jericho a great multitude followed him and, and behold a blind man sitting interesting how one author dis describes as Jesus was walking into the city the, the blind man began to, began to cry out Lord have mercy on me and another writer is saying when Jesus was walking out of the city the blind man is yelling, screaming, Jesus, have mercy on me. So which one is it? Him coming into the city or him walking out of the city? And this actually puzzles. I was reading some commentary about this. This puzzles me because it's the same story, same, same, pretty much the disciples were there, just a different point of view. One side Jesus walking in, one side Jesus walking out. And I'm thinking more and more and more about it. It all makes a lot of sense. As Jesus was walking into the city. That poor man was crying, Jesus, have mercy on me. As Jesus was in that city of Jericho, the poor man is crying out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And as Jesus was walking out of the city, the poor man was still yelling, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus didn't heal him instantly. This poor man was desiring for Jesus as Jesus walked in, as Jesus was in the city, as Jesus was walking out of the city. This poor man is crying, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And finally, 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 he caught the attention of Jesus and Jesus says, bring that man over here. And that man was made whole. I want to let you know, brother and sister, hunger. God responds to hunger. We have a need in our life. I just want to let you know, do not give up. It is in the nature of God to be longed for. It is in the nature God loves to be pulled. I believe God loved the wrestling match he had between him and Jacob. Let me go. No, God, I will not let you go. And God says, let me go. No, God, I will not let you go. Let me go. No, God, I will not let you go until you bless my life. Jacob, you're no longer Jacob. You're Israel. How often do we see this in the Bible, in the same story? The Bible says that, that when, you, when they were in the storm and the waves were hitting against them and the winds were strong, the Bible says that Jesus was walking by them. Not walking to them, walking by them. And Jesus made it as though the disciples cried out to him. 
When Jesus died and when was resurrected from the dead, he came in contact with some of his disciples and he, they began to walk. And Jesus, the Bible says that, that Jesus was about to walk by them, was about to leave them. But no, the people cried, no, no, would you just stay with us a little bit? There's something Jesus longs to belong for. Jesus loves when his people call out to him. Jesus loves when, when his people desire him. And there Jesus was, rowing away from his boat, nothing to do with these people. And the people long for him, Jesus, 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 we want you. And Jesus stopped everything that he was doing and began to minister to those people. I want to let you know every person in this place, hunger is a sign of life. Hunger is a sign of life. If you physically are sick, one of the first things you lose is your appetite. People who are sick physically, either with fever or whatever sickness they have, one of the first things they lose is their desire to eat. Whenever people are sick, the first thing they ask, have you eaten anything? Just eat something so your body can have some sort of energy because you no longer want to eat your sick. Something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with your body. I want to let you know every person in this place, same thing spiritually. If you are not hungry for God, if you are not hungry for the things of the spirit, spiritually you are not where you're supposed to be. Hunger is a sign of life. Physically, spiritually, it's the same thing. Hunger is a sign of life. If you are hungering for God, it means you are healthy spiritually. If there's no desire for his word, no desire for his presence, no desire to ministry, I want to just let you know, guys, maybe spiritually you're, you're not where you're supposed to be. These people were so hungry for God. And as they're there ministering, as Jesus there laying hands on the sick, healing those, healing the lepers, teaching them, ministering, hanging out with them. The Bible says, verse 14, and when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, to not, there's no need for them to go away. You give them something to eat. I want to quickly pinpoint, I believe, a very, very important point over here for us to realize that, again, we're reading this from Matthew, but John recalls the story a little bit different, different as, he said, as he said, well, here is a boy with five, with five loaves and two fish. And the reason why I think this is so important for us to realize is that when we read this portion of scripture, the Bible says there's, there was 5,000 men plus women and children. Between 15 to 20,000 people were there. But for me, I find it kind of ironic that the disciples didn't even bother to count the children. Didn't even bother to count the women. For them, it was just... The men are here, but the women and children that we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not even going to count them. They didn't even pay attention to them. They said, yeah, there's some women and children, but there's 5,000 men. Jesus, there's 5,000 men over here. And I love what God does. I love what Jesus does. He doesn't use the 5,000 men. He doesn't use the powerful disciples. No, he takes a boy. He takes a boy. Why? He takes a boy who the disciples didn't even count worthy to count. Disciples didn't even bother to count the, the children. And who does God decide to use in this portion of scripture? A child. And God said, you know what? You think you're, you're, they're not even worthy for you to count them. It's all right. You may, you may think that they're outcasts. It's completely fine. But in my family, nobody's an outcast. In the kingdom of God, nobody's an outcast. And God used the boy. And guess what? 2,000 years later, we're talking about the boy. 2,000 years later, the four gospels are talking about a mighty miracle that began with a boy. Somebody who, who the society didn't even feel worthy of counting. God said, you know what? That's who I'm going to use. And I think it's so amazing that this is not the first time we see this in the Bible. Samuel comes to anoint a king. 
comes to the house of Jesse. Jesse lines up his brothers, brothers, his sons, lines up his sons. I can only imagine Samuel at this portion. Well, Samuel at the time, he's thinking, all of these are kings. These all fit the description of a king. Every one of these are good looking, tall, present themselves well. Here is Samuel going through each and every one of them, and he couldn't find anyone. And he's asking, is there anybody else, any other brother? And here's Jesse probably rolling his eyes, saying, yeah, I have a this other son. He's a little weird. He's probably, uh, probably singing to the sheep at the moment. He's, uh, he's a little scrawny. He's skinny. He's a little underdeveloped. He's writing songs to, I don't know, he's, he's just one of those guys. You don't want to see him. Sim is probably like, yeah, I probably don't want to see him. And yeah, he's, he's nothing. He's, he's, he's an outcast. Nonetheless, bring him to me. He brings him to me. God begins to speak. That's, that's, that's the next king. Society looks at him as an outcast. His father literally doesn't even recognize him as his own son. It's a fact that Jesse and David had a little strife be- between each, each other. The relationship between Jesse and his father was not the, the, the greatest. But, and, and God looked at this little boy and said, yep, there he is. There he is. That's who I want to use. This is the guy who I want to use. Society doesn't think much of him. Society thinks he's a little weird, but that's okay. That's who I want to use. Gideon. God begins to speak to Gideon. Gideon responds. I mean, this, this, this guy was an emotional wreck. God begins to speak to you. You're a man of valor. He says, are you kidding me? I'm, I'm the weakest of all the people. Literally, his, his words to paraphrase a God of all the people that you could have came to, I'm the last one you should be coming to. Of any one of the thousands of people you came to me, I'm literally the weakest. I'm a nobody. I am, my name don't mean nothing. I, my family is the weakest, smallest of the crowd. God said, God, that's who I want to use. And we look at this portion of scripture, which I find so amazing. The disciples didn't even waste their time counting the children, counting the women, Society at the time, especially look 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 down at women. They just they had children. They're nothing. Like no, we're not even. We're not even gonna bother this. God said, "Yeah, you know, you know, if you're not gonna bother this, it's okay. I will." This boy God used, and every gospel talks about it. Guys, the people that God uses a lot of times are people who we who we least expect who we least expect. I want to let, let you know in this place, maybe you're sitting, sitting here and watching or listening to my words or watching online, you're thinking, yeah, I can never stand up here. I can never go to a, the mission field. I can never sing. I can never serve the people. I cannot go to somebody in the streets. I, I, I'm not bold enough to do this. I want to let you know, maybe you're not bold enough to do this. Maybe you can't do this. I couldn't do this. I stuttered my whole life. But there is somebody who's living in you that is able to do all things. Who's able to do all things. Maybe you don't qualify good because God who's inside of you will, will, will qualify you. He will build from you some of the most powerful people if you only allow him to. Matthew chapter chapter 14, verse 19. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves, two fishes. He looked up into the heaven. He blessed it. And he broke the loaves and began to give to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. Next point I want to talk about is this. Very simple. Very, very powerful. I want to let you know that Jesus was, was a man. The Bible says that he found himself in the likeness of man. God experienced, well, Jesus experienced humanity in every sphere. So what does that mean? It means, it means he had his fair share of worries. We know how much Jesus worried. Jesus worried so much that his sweat became blood. He had his fair share of, of disappointments. 
We see Jesus being angry. We see Jesus being alone. We see Jesus being rejected. We see Jesus experiencing humanity in all, in all, pretty much in, in all levels. And why is it important to understand, guys, Jesus had this thing that each and every one of us have, which is called common sense. He looked at the two fish, he looked at the five loaves, and he looked at the 15,000 people, 20,000 people in front of him, and obviously that math doesn't add up here. Obviously these two fishes, five loaves, are not going to feed this many people. Obviously this is, this is, a, this is literally a laughable matter. I can almost see the, the, the disciples back there giggling in the back, like, well this, well, this should be good. But not much that Jesus had, he still lifted it up to heaven, and he blessed it, and he thanked God for what he had. Maybe you're sitting in this place, and the job that you're working at is not the job that you wanted. The house you're living in is not the house that you always wanted. Maybe the family that you are given is a lot different than you expected. Maybe the ministry that, that you're in that you envisioned so much is not lining up to where you thought it was going to be. Maybe the life that, that you're living is not how you expected it to be. I want to let you know to every person in this, in this place, if you have a fridge full of food, you're better off, you're wealthier than 95% of this world. And Jesus took what he had, which was so little, which was obviously not enough, but he took it and he blessed it. And he thanked God for the very little that, that, that he had. And because I believe he thanked God for the little that he got, God can trust him with, with more. And for many of us in this place, we're stuck at the same place for year after year after year because we cannot recognize the very little blessings in our, in our, in our lives. And we cannot even thank God for them. Guys, I want to let every one of you know that it's, it's just so important for you to know that what you think is little. You're not even going to thank God for, for the little things. Then I'm sorry, God will not trust, trust you with more. One of my brothers told me a very interesting story. He was, he decided to bless this one missionary. This is in our church many, many years ago. He, he decided to, to bless this one missionary. And he said, the only thing I had in, the, in my pocket was like, I think it was like $80, like $90. He just literally took the $86 for $7. Like it was just change-wise. He came up to this missionary. He said, hey, this is what I have. This is what I have. And um, I want to bless you with this. And the missionary look, he's like, knows how much some of my, uh, my other brother, brother, brothers give. He said, hey, listen, like just collect more and then give it to me. I, in other words, I don't really need pocket change. And my brother was like, okay. It just so happened that a few months later, he ran into Teal Osborne. Any of you guys know who Teal Os Osborne is? At, at a cafe. And same thing. He's like, I want to bless this man. I'm talking about he had, he had like $13 in his, in his pocket. He had nothing in his pocket. And he started talking to Teal Osborne. He's like, I was like this, this is just all, all I have. I'm sorry. Teal Osborne grabs that money, grabs his hand, and he began to just pray, like, God, bless this man. Bless this man. And he's, and he's, and Teal Osborne was, was, was a, a pastor knows who he is. Many of you know who Teal Osborne was. He was a general of the faith. He was a Billy Graham, that, that level of a, of a preacher. He took out some pocket change and, and began to bless. And you know what later, a few weeks happened, and he wrote my brother a handwritten letter thanking him for that change. While another person, don't, 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 don't give me these. This, 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 give me something that's worthy of being given. Guys, if you cannot, if you cannot be thankful for the small things that you have, don't expect God to, to bless you with more. Jesus took this low, these, the, these five loaves and two fish and he looked up to heaven and he blessed God. Sincerely, God, 
thank you for this food. Thank you for this fish. Thank you for this bread. And he was in such thankfulness to God for the little that he had that God took this and he multiplied it so much. Guys, maybe you, 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 ought, you ought to begin to thank God for the job that he gave you. Maybe it's not what you expected it to be, but I want to let you know that God will bless you. Maybe you should start thanking God for the cars that you have. Maybe it's not what you've always wanted, but it's a blessing. When you, begin to, when, you, when you begin to be thankful for God for the small things, I guarantee you, God will begin to bless you. God will begin to bless you. And as I con con conclude with this evening, evening, this af afternoon, I want to say that this final lesson that I got, this, I got from this portion of Scripture. And as we continue with the story, Jesus blesses the five fish, five uh, flows of bread, two fish, and he hands it out into the crowd. And after they're finished with this evening, the, the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples go into the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he, was, and while he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountainside by himself to pray. And now when evening had come, he was alone there, but the boat now was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the winds were contrary, and they were caught in a massive storm. And this final lesson that I really got from this portion of Scripture that I think is so, so, so important is this. They had an amazing few days. They had a powerful few days, man. They, they saw the dead raised. They heard Jesus teach some of the greatest teachings they have ever, ever, ever heard before. They saw Jesus multiply food. They saw Jesus heal the sick. They ministered to the people. Spiritually, they had a successful day. Spiritually, it was a day of victory spiritually it was a day where they served the people they ministered to the people and, and it was just an amazing day spiritually if I can have the person the keyboard please come up but spiritually it was just such an amazing day they served man they God moved but what I found very amazing and interesting is that in the midst of them serving the people, in the midst of the miracle signs and wonders when nighttime hit, when nighttime hit and they're out in the sea, all of a sudden the winds begin to, to, to beat against them. The storm rolls up. All of a sudden waves begin to crash over them. And it's so interesting because in victory, all of the sudden, hell began to break loose against them. I want to let every person in this place know something that is so important for you to know, for me to know. That is this, whenever we do the work of God, I guarantee you opposition will rise against you. Whenever you do the work of God, opposition will rise against you. And I'll go even so far as to say if you are not experiencing opposition, if you are not experiencing travels, what are you doing for the kingdom of God? The moment you begin to serve, the moment you begin to minister, the moment you begin to devastate the kingdom of hell, hell will rise up against you. The moment you begin to, to, to really preach the gospel, the moment you begin to serve, the moment you begin to preach, the moment you begin to do God's work, I'm telling you, all of hell breaks loose against you and they'll do everything in their power to bring you down. These people, the disciples, they were doing God's work. Oh, they heard the best teachings. They've experienced some spiritual highs. They themselves laid hands on the sick in the name of Jesus and seen them recover. But what happens to them? All of a sudden, the waves begin to go against them. The wind is blowing against them. It reminds me of the story in the Old Testament of prophet Elijah. Elijah with a J. Elijah had a very amazing amazing day spiritually for him where, where they destroy he destroyed 400 
prophets of Baal, evil, evil people. One day he was destroying these evil prophets and God's moving and man the people are recognizing that God's moving and these evil prophets and God really came through and destroyed these prophets and Elijah is, 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 is walking strong because man he's powerful all of the sudden God's using him so powerful yet the very next day that day he does he really really damaged the kingdom of hell really devastated this the kingdom of hell he really brought damage to the darkness the very next day all darkness rise up against him and Jezebel threatens his life and he said and she, and she literally threatens to kill him and there is Elijah fleeing running for his life what is my point here man Elijah had a great day Elijah had a phenomenal day in the presence of God Elijah had a phenomenal day taking care of the enemies of God he had a spiritual victory the next day, hell breaks loose against him and the poor guy is running for his life. The disciples had a phenomenal day in the presence of God, yet nighttime hit and the waves and the winds and the storm begins to beat against them. Dear people, do not be surprised when stuff like this happens. Do not be surprised when trials come against you. Do not be surprised when the storms of life begin to really hit against you. Let that not be a surprise to you. But I want to let you know this. At these disciples during the daytime, like I said, experienced some good spiritual victories at nighttime they were discouraged and all of a sudden hell began to rise up against them but you know what happened Jesus came through one of the greatest things that ever happened in Peter's life happened at that very at the very evening when Peter began to walk in water it was at the same evening all of the sudden in the middle of the storm they come into contact with Jesus all of a sudden in the middle of that storm Jesus pulls through and when things seem hopeless, Jesus pulls through. And because of this, Jesus calms the storm. The waves calm. The wind dies down. The following day, they continue to minister. I'm telling you guys, God allows storms to come into our lives. You know why? Because as we're serving God, as we're ministering, God will allow your faith to be tested. God will allow difficult times to come in into your life. But you know what happens when difficult times come into your life? You call upon God like Peter called upon God on the boat and Jesus comes in and Jesus calms the storm. Jesus calms the waves and they continue ministry the very next day. Why is this so important for us? It's because of this. Every time we we endure a storm we come and we find Jesus in that storm and we know that Jesus pulls us out of the storm so I have news for you that later on in life when things become difficult you can say man God God got me out of that storm therefore I know he'll get me out of this storm all of a sudden maybe the following day maybe you're in this maybe you're living in a life of ministry and you have ministered and all of a sudden hell is breaking loose against you but in the midst of that you find the ability to praise God you find the ability to worship God you find God in the middle of the storm I have news for you next time you go into the battlefield where you minister where you serve your faith Faith is just only so much stronger because you've seen God work before and now you know that God can work again. The disciples endured some powerful miracles after that storm. Every single time their faith was shaped. I want all of you guys, all of you church to please rise up to your feet as we're gonna conclude our evening with just some time and praise and worship. And as we pray, I am going to open up the altar as we pray. Guys, I'm just going to be honest with you. 
I don't like to beg people to come up. I really think if, if people want to come up, they come up. If they don't, they don't. Up to you. But what I want to really pray for people in this place, maybe you're at a time where you're in that storm. And you're thinking, man, I, I'm looking for God, but I just can't see him. Serge, I hear your words. I, I hear you. Man, I, I, I'm listening to you. I'm amen in you. I'm writing down notes, but man, I just, I, I just can't. I just can't see God in the storm. Serge, you don't know how difficult it is. I'm going through this. I'm going through that. I, I don't know. I just, I, I can't see. I, I hear your words, but I don't understand. As I want to let you know, God is by your side. And maybe you just need that spiritual encouragement. As the pastors are here, the preachers are here, but outside from the pastors, the preachers, the ministers, aside from all this, Jesus is here. Jesus is in this place. Jesus wants to touch your life. Jesus wants to minister to you. As the Bible says, and I believe this is Isaiah chapter 43. Now thus says the Lord that created you, O Jacob, and he, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And when you walk through the rivers, I will be with you. And the waves shall not overflow you. And when you pass by the fires, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame kindle upon you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Maybe you're walking through that fire. Maybe you're walking through the water. And maybe the, the flames are getting pretty hot. They're getting pretty, pretty hot. They shall not burn you. For, for God said, He is your Lord, your God. As we go into a time of worship, a time of praise, let's just bow our heads. And if you're that person and you just, you just need that encouragement prayer, feel free to run, run up here, come up here, and we'll pray for you. Dear God, we love you. We love you. We thank you. We thank you, Spirit of the living God, for you are good. You are good. Maybe we cannot see it, but God, we know that you are good. Maybe sometimes we cannot feel it, but we know that you are a good God. And Father, we pray as we walk through the storms of life, we pray, Lord Jesus, let your hand be upon our lives. Maybe we cannot see it. Maybe we cannot feel it, but Father, let us know that you are by our side. Let us know that you are with us. And Father, we pray in Jesus' mighty name, bless every person in this place. Bless every person in this place. I pray, Almighty God, that the hunger of those who were once hungry return. Father, there are people in this place that just feel dry in their spiritual walk. I pray, Almighty God, let, 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 let your hunger fill their lives and they will hunger and thirst after righteousness, after you, Almighty Jesus. I pray, Almighty God, for people in this place. If they are not satisfied with the little that you have given them, I pray, Almighty God, that you will open up their eyes and that they will see you, Almighty God. I pray for every person who is walking through the storms, through the trials of life. Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you would touch them, that you would let them know that you are by their side, that you are with them. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one
those words for just a few more moments, that word hallelujah. Hallelujah. That word hallelujah, it means praise be unto God, praise be unto Yah, Yahweh, the one whose name is so holy that man cannot utter, the one whose name is established above every other name. That word hallelujah means praise be unto God. The Bible says that Joshua and the Israelites, when they came across the walls of Jericho, God had commanded them to march around that city, those city walls for six days and remain silent. No weapons, no shields, just march around the city wall for six days. And on that seventh day, he said, when you march, March six times. And when you march that seventh time, on that seventh time, you shall cry out. What does it mean to cry out when those Israelites, they marched with their frustrations, with their misunderstandings and misconceptions and everything that they had experienced from the land of Egypt to this point? They put it into praise. And what they cried out wasn't just a cry, it was a cry of hallel, of praise before God. And in the midst of that cry, the walls of Jericho began to shake. And as they cried, those walls came down and the people of Israel stood victorious over what seemed like an impossible situation. And as we go back into worship and sing the, those words just a few more times, this is what I want to say to you is that in the midst of your impossible situation, God says praise. God says praise. When you feel like complaining, begin to praise. When you be, feel like you ought to whine, begin to praise. When you feel like you need to shout, begin to praise. When you experience doubt, begin to praise. Like our brother said today, sometimes we need to praise God and thank Him for things that we don't understand and things that haven't happened yet. But in our praise, we step out in faith and belief that what God has promised will come to be. And when we end that prayer and when we say that word, Amen, that word means let it be let it be so every time we pray every time we cry out every time we challenge god in his promises we end our prayer and we say and so lord let it be and so i don't know what you're going through today i don't know if you've come here sick i don't know if there's something that you're battling or you're struggling with but in the midst of that begin to praise him begin to worship him and when you're just about done you say let it be lord let it be according to your word let it be according to your will let it be according to your scriptures let it be let it be so as we sing that word hallelujah 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 we cry out and we praise we don't understand it yet but we praise because you understand you have seen your spirit has gone before us you've made a way for us you've cleared the road for us and we don't walk alone we walk in the midst of your spirit we walk in the midst of your presence we bless your name we lift up your name lift up his name lift up his name Lift it up over your life. Oh, lift it up over your family. Lift it up over your career. Lift it up over what you're going through. Right now, lift up his name. Declare his name as mightier and greater than your circumstances. Lift up his name and declare it as higher and 
greater than your sickness. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Oh, may your name be glorious. Oh, may his name be glorious. Oh, make his name glorious in your life, in your walk, in your struggle. Make his name glorious. Jesus, be lifted up. Jesus, be exalted. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We pray over sickness. We pray over sickness. In the name of Jesus, we call upon the broken body of Jesus Christ. We call upon every stripe and every scar and every nail pierced hand in the name of Jesus and enter into the victory of healing in the name of Jesus we pray we pray over addiction and affliction in the name of Jesus the deliverance would come the deliverance would enter our homes in the name of Jesus that sleepless nights be filled with peace and calm because you are the one that speaks to the storm you are the one that calms the waves and brings the so see the still. We bless your name. We lift up your name. We lift up your name. Jesus be that Lord, we come before you and we thank you for such a holy moment. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this word, Father God, that dark circumstances and attacks from the enemy only tell us one thing, that we're doing your will and we're fighting for your kingdom. And we pray, Father God, we will walk through that valley, but give us the strength to do so. Give us the vision to see what it is that you want from us in every moment of our every day. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we pray over every person in this place and watching online who has a need today. We lift up that need before you, before your throne. We lift up that need. And we enter in faith and belief that you will take care of all and that you are creating a testimony so great that maybe we don't understand at this point in our time, but one day we will look back and see how great and magnificent your hand was in our lives. We thank you, Father God. We, we ask for your forgiveness for every moment that we've neglected, for all the blessings you've sent our way that we have not paid mind to. We thank you, Jesus, that you are working even when we're not working, that you're working even when we don't realize it. you are working and we bless your name. And so now we pray, Father God, over this congregation, over this community, that you would fill us up and send us out for your great and holy work to be the people you've called us to be. We bless your name. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let it be. Let it be, Lord.